Have you ever pruned a tree or cut back a plant? And then when you took a step back and looked, you were shocked by how barren it looked? I used to be reluctant to cut my plants back because I saw no good reason to inflict intentional trauma and stress on a living thing. To do such a thing seemed contrary to everything we think of as healthy. But there's a reason for pruning. It helps the plant grow and thrive. When we prune a plant or a tree, the organism is able to then put an even greater energy into growing more. What seems harsh or damaging is actually motivating to the plant. When faced with trauma, the plants could all shrivel up and die, but they don't. In a sense, they experience post-traumatic growth. This may be just one simple example of nature's fight for survival, And human life isn't always so simple. And when things get tough, we actually all have choices to make, to give in or to give more, to get bitter or to get better. We can choose to be like the tree and face our problems rather than run from them. We can choose to accept that the stressors we are facing are creating an opportunity for us to expand our capacity for resilience and ability to thrive beyond any circumstances. Two weeks after I began bookending my days with my new rituals of journaling and meditation, I had an appointment at my rheumatologist's office. I had received a secondary diagnosis to my eye disease, a chronic autoimmune condition that required that I take medication that was administered like chemotherapy intravenously over several hours. I went to the office that day for my very first treatment And within five minutes of being hooked up to the drip, I went into anaphylactic shock. This rendered me ineligible to receive this or any other systemic treatment, but giving up was not an option. I had to find a different approach. I had to be like the tree being pruned only to grow back in a spectacular fashion. I was going to use this challenge to my favor. Did not know it then, but looking back, I can definitely tell you that all stress is not a bad thing. At times when I felt incredibly scared, like when I thought about the future, I'd return to a line from one of my favorite poets, from her work, The Uses of Sorrow. Mary Oliver wrote, someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. I had a box of darkness and it held me in the failed marriage and it also gave me my son. It held my failing health, but that was also the impetus for me to be able to pay attention and appreciate and take care of my physical health. My mental state was definitely in the darkness, but that turned out to be an incredible opportunity for me to step into my courage. My life had been dictated for so long by other people and by outside forces, my parents, my husband, my religion, society, and now I felt free to make my own decisions. That was my reckoning, and I decided I wanted to get better. And I understood that getting better would require me to give more, to consciously lean into the stressors and use them to grow. I decided I was going to see this box of darkness as a positive thing, and I would accept its gift as graciously and authentically as possible. When I got home from the failed infusion that evening, I walked into the kitchen and I saw that bright red journal sitting on the table and it looked like it was taunting me. Do the work, it whispered. So I sat down and I opened it up to a clean page and I started to make a new list. And this time I wrote down all the things I could explore to try and get healthy. I didn't want to try another medication. My body was trying to tell me something and to lead me in a different direction. This I knew for sure. I wrote out a list that was just a free flow of all the things I knew that were good for me, like acupuncture and yoga, anti-inflammatory diets, the beach, fresh air, meditation, girl time, me time, long walks, just to name a few. I also added other coping mechanisms to the list, like saying no, asserting myself, having time management, and then As I had before with my enormous to-do list, I started to chunk the information into categories that seemed to occur naturally. Work and professional chunk, the physical fitness, 
emotional and mind, spiritual category, relationships and community. Each of these categories contained a list of strategies and activities that I enjoy and that also could contribute something to my well-being. And they were the things that were completely authentic to me. I didn't know it then, but I was actually putting together the foundation of a formal self-care plan, also known as a coping plan. Some of the categories began to intersect, which I later learned is completely normal in this type of wellness blueprint. I want you to understand why I wrote down the specific things that I wrote down so that you get the magnitude of the impact that it had on my life. But first, it's critical that we define what self-care is, what it isn't, why we need it, and how a self-care plan can help us on the path to getting better. Self-care means that we commit to taking an active role in safeguarding our mental and physical wellness, proactively and especially in times of duress. Most of us know that self-care is good for us. It increases our emotional and physical stamina, it improves our self-esteem, and builds resilience. It even goes further by ensuring that we can remain compassionate, impassioned, and engaged. Maintaining self-care means being in balance so that we can engage in the important work we do without sacrificing other aspects of our life. It means being able to maintain a positive attitude in spite of our own challenges and the larger injustices that exist in the world. Self-care activities create daily improvements in our lives and have beneficial long-term effects. But they're not always fun, and sometimes they can be pretty boring. We also might feel guilty about self-care because it seems, well, selfish. It goes against everything we've been taught about what it means to be a good friend or parent or spouse, partner, coworker, or even community member. Because self-care means putting ourselves first. And we've been conditioned to believe that that's wrong. It's rude. And it's not all consistent with the actions of the martyrs we tend to look up to throughout history. The selfless ones who have inspired so many. These people we admire have had to endure often unimaginable hardship. When we are taught about their lives, we learn about their sacrifices. Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Malala, Dr. King. These individuals are rightfully linked to self-sacrifice and suffering. They didn't have time for yoga. There are two problems contributing to the negative connotations of self-care culture. The first is that we are taught that self-care is self-centered. The word self has a negative connotation because the word extends only to the individual. Right from the start, we need to expand our view of the self in self-care to extend beyond the individual. Our definition should extend to our family, community, the natural world, and all sentient beings. Self-care actually encompasses protecting this larger order. Self-care is not a virtue. We must consider ourselves as role models and create the structures in which we work consistently towards the ends that we want to see in this world. The second problem contributing to the negative self-care culture is that the term self-care has been hijacked by corporations, swallowing it up into this industrial wellness complex. The way the term is broadly used today has very little to do with the political origins of the concept of self-preservation. Self-care was at one point, and in some cases still is, the only form of wellness, survival, and respite from political and structural oppression. For communities that feel like they were under attack by their own government, with little access to health care, fresh food, clean water, and safe housing, Self-care is not just a matter of self-love and self-compassion. It becomes a radical act of survival. One of the main issues with the industrial wellness machine in our society is that it's mostly geared towards white women of means. That's because it's associated with the purchase of goods and services that are, in fact, indulgent and frivolous. And that means that self-care is also seen as an occasional practice. The fact is, is that self-care is for everyone. 
It's for men and minorities, people of color, and individuals who can't drop $20 on a yoga class once a month, let alone twice a week. Everyone deserves self-care. The reality is that if self-care was promoted for what it really is, very hard work, not very sexy work, it wouldn't be an attractive marketing play for brands and corporations. Self-care can be really hard because it's not a quick fix. Ironically, neither is our own inner journey or something as lofty as social justice work. We understand that rarely, if ever, do landscapes change overnight, but we tend to be less patient when it comes to wellness. It is much easier for us to make decisions that feel good right now than it is to have the discipline to make decisions that may suck now, but will feel really great later on. Self-care is not self-indulgent. Self-indulgence is procuring immediate gratification of our smallest whims and desires, behaviors that alter our mood or provide temporary escape from our discomforts. Self-care actually requires discipline. The way we can tell the difference between indulgence and true acts of self-care is by asking ourselves if the act is a quick fix or something that truly serves us. Does the quick fix yield long-term benefits or is it potentially harmful to me? Some real world examples of how self-care can look like discipline include committing to only streaming one episode instead of binging a whole season of that series so that you can get to bed at a decent hour and get a full night's sleep, or choosing not to have that second cocktail, maybe learning to say no when we don't want to or can't do something, or waking up early to make time to meditate or journal or work out. While I was writing my list out of true despair and a will to survive, there was also an instinctual inner knowing that I had to give up most of my vices in order to truly dedicate myself to self-care, my healing and my overall wellness. If the work we do in the world is larger than ourselves, and for me at that moment being a mother to my son was just that, then self-care means that we must have clearly defined boundaries to help ensure our long-term physical, mental, and spiritual health. That's not to say that there aren't healthy indulgences we can enjoy. For me, these were defined by even the smallest actions that helped me restore balance in my life during that incredibly imbalanced time. There are things that bring me moments of joy and happiness, like spending an evening reading a good book with a mud mask on my face, or shutting down my phone and not responding to texts or emails for a few hours of solitude, or maybe engaging in a meaningful conversation while sharing a meal with a friend. None of these indulgences can be considered frivolous. My point is this, self-care is not one size fits all. If it's right for you, then it's right. The biggest challenge I needed to overcome, and that you will need to as well, is the guilt I felt when butting up against the ingrained beliefs that taking time for myself is selfish. What I learned from living through that experience is that tending to myself is a way to reaffirm that I value myself. And because I do value myself, I must also honor myself. Taking that time to reaffirm in writing that I am not broken set me on this path. It also positioned me in the front and center as my own best cheerleader and self-advocate. From that front row, I was able to proclaim irrefutably that self-care is actually a profoundly unselfish act, a truly selfless act that made me into not only a healthier being, but a more engaged mother, and in time, an impassioned self-care activist too. For me, Coming out of a literal darkness was the impetus for me to ask why and how I had entered a despairing and bleak space to even begin with. Remove the religious characteristics from the concept born again, and it extends perfectly to my renewal or to any experience where there is a life-shaking trauma followed by an awakening. In 1902, William James, the philosopher who also helped establish psychology as a formal discipline, wrote in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, that there are two kinds of people in this world, the once born 
and the twice born. Once born are biologically predisposed to happiness. These people have an almost childlike acceptance of the way life is. They aren't bothered by the intense suffering or evil in this world. And should they find themselves at some point living through a traumatic event or in a crisis mode, once born people do not use the opportunity to grow and expand. Instead, they remain in the dark place, stunted by the experience and never wandering too far from the safety of who they thought they were when the crisis began. On the flip side of the coin are twice born people who use their personal adversity and setbacks as opportunities for inner reckoning. They use their strife as an opportunity to become the better or even the best version of themselves. Twice born people look for purpose and meaning in the darkest moments. The darkness becomes an invitation for them to seek out the light that remains, even if it is hidden from their view. James wrote that, quote, the process is one of redemption, not of mere reversion to natural health. And the sufferer, when saved, is saved but what seems to him as a second birth, a deeper kind of conscious being than he could enjoy before. Confucius actually put it more simply. He said, we all have two lives. The second one begins when we realize we only have one. An awakening of such magnitude happens in stages, similar to the process of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You go through an ambiguous sense of loss, lacking a clear resolution. It can be a physical loss, like the loss of my eyesight, or losing a friend or a loved one, or it can be a psychological loss, like when we watch a family member retreat into dementia or addiction, or when a partner cheats on us and we realize that things are suddenly changed in a way that cannot be undone. For me, it was the convergence of so many losses, divorce, a home, a family unit, my health, and the future as I had envisioned it, really my entire way of life. The lost often leads to an uncharted path. A true awakening meant committing to the radical acceptance that certain things may not be under my control and may never be, and that I need to stop looking at my life with hindsight, but instead with what author Karen Samuelson calls kind sight. She wrote, view your life with kind sight. Stop beating yourself up about things from your past. Instead of slapping yourself on the forehead and asking, what was I thinking? Breathe and ask yourself the kinder question. What was I learning? I liken the concept of radical acceptance to the children's game, shoots and ladders. If you never played it, the game has a hundred squares with the simple objective of getting your marker from the first square to the hundredth. Randomly placed around the board are ladders that can help boost you up to a higher square and slides that will take you all the way back down. The worst place to land on the board is on the 87th square, just 13 squares short from winning the game. Because if you land there, you hit a slide that sets you back almost all the way to the beginning. But the game doesn't end there. You just keep spinning the wheel again and again, and you continue to get ahead incrementally, hoping to hit a few ladders and get a boost whenever you can. And life really is like shoots and ladders because we tend to think that life is being unfair in the moments when we seem to backslide, but it really isn't being unfair because everyone gets dragged back down at some point. The ride down can be hard to stomach, but having radical acceptance means that we view the square we slide back down to as a new baseline from which we can begin to climb up again. So when blindness became my new baseline, here's what I learned. Radical acceptance is not the same as giving up. It means that we don't need to spend our precious energy resisting or fighting against what is. We accept our reality and apply our focus elsewhere. Acceptance can only happen through the advent of forgiveness. A trusted friend who is also a psychotherapist once told me that we all walk around as two versions of ourselves. One version is the unconditioned self, 
innocent, untouched by any trauma or criticism or injustice we may have lived through. And the other version is the learned self, which we commonly refer to as the ego, which works very hard to separate us from our true selves, the whole healthy human being we are. The ego is just focused on what is externally perceived as good, praiseworthy achievements and things that yield dividends. So when our unconditioned self is present, we just have to show up exactly as we are, for ourselves or in the world, and we already are the person we want to be, flaws, fractures, and all. When trauma hits and we are stopped in our tracks, we use it as an opportunity to stop chasing and start choosing. Choosing forgiveness is the first step. And we can start by forgiving ourselves, reflecting on our past with kind sight for all the times we allowed the ego to block our authenticity. But kind sight doesn't only apply to the past. And that's a good thing because we actually live in the present and we need to bring compassion and kindness to the now as well. When you track the rhythm of your life, it's not just a straight line, right? It's a sequence of highs and lows. And when we step back to look at the pattern, it is reminiscent of what we would see on a heartbeat monitor, with peaks and valleys indicating that we are very much alive. On that monitor, and in life, quite frankly, we're not going for a flat line. We want to learn to be grateful for the peaks and be graceful in the valleys. And we'd like to feel content when we plateau. A sustainable self-care plan is one that follows that cadence, that will stay with you through the ups and downs of your life. So how do we envision a self-care regimen that is sustainable? The answer is that it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It doesn't look like a list of New Year's resolutions either which is good since we all know that people usually don't stick to those anyways. When I first created a plan that addressed my specific needs and goals, I didn't always stick to it. But I didn't beat myself up for making an unhealthy choice once in a while either. I accepted my infractions and I kept going. Eventually, by giving myself permission to begin each day anew and by creating the most critical component, a community of care. I was able to develop a self-care rhythm that worked for me. Identifying a self-care rhythm that works makes it easier to integrate into what we are already doing on a daily basis. I learned by trial and error that whatever your self-care plan winds up looking like, it's got to be gentle enough to work. Meaning, it has to be incremental so it can be composed of a lot of little things. It's not a disruption, but rather an enhancement of your regular patterns of operation. We can break down self-care rhythms daily, weekly, seasonally, even annually. These are our rhythms, daily, weekly, seasonally, annually. So for my daily rhythm, what helped me finally be able to get into a groove was identifying the sort of mudroom or entrance hall in my life, so to speak. Like most people, I have a hard time creating and maintaining a balance between work, social life, family, and other obligations. I was always taking work home with me, whether it was physical paperwork or the emotional burdens of my clients. I found that just like an entryway or a mudroom in your home, creating a distinct space dedicated to the transition from your public self to the more personal you can be invaluable in finding a healthy work-life balance. The mudroom ritual is a micro practice that becomes a habit over time and contributes to the overall self-care. Some examples of what that looked like for me was being mindful on my commute home by driving in silence instead of taking phone calls or listening to talk radio or taking a walk around the block with my dog but without my phone or sitting in my car for a few moments and maybe doing a quick breathing exercise in the driveway, then setting an intention before rushing into the house or rushing into my son's aftercare at preschool as soon as I parked the car. These were seemingly small steps, but they allowed me the space to let go of the stressors from work 
and show up more fully present in other areas of my life. Like a dedicated space to wash the proverbial mud off my shoes from one part of my day and move unburdened into the next. The mud room became an integral part of my daily self-care practice. Consider identifying also the rhythms of your daily life. What can qualify as your mudroom? Where is this physical space or natural pause that can exist that will allow you to transition more elegantly from one demand or obligation to another? As the architect of your life, where can you successfully build out these entryways? Having a mudroom in your home is great unless it becomes a magnet for clutter. Shoes and boots carelessly strewn around, umbrellas and cold weather gears, sports equipment, bags of purchases waiting to be returned to places. The problem is that clutter eventually becomes an unnecessary obstacle course, slowing you down considerably when you're trying to enter or exit your home. What can prevent this madness? A team effort, of course a community approach to the common cause of an obstacle-free zone. The same is true of our proverbial self-care mudrooms. Even though I wrote down and chunked out my self-care activities, my adherence to the plan was inconsistent because my mudroom was filled with clutter. Eventually, it was all the women in my life who became my support system that helped me get this clutter in order. These are the women who were friends and became sisters. Some were acquaintances when I was married, but then as a single mom, they became my safety net. Ultimately, I learned that this group of individuals were my formal community of care, and that community was exactly what I needed in order to fulfill my obligations to myself. It was an epiphany that came to me after I'd been venting to a friend about how I had no time or energy left at the end of each night to take care of even one thing on my list. She asked me a very simple question. What do you need right now to get to one thing on your list on a regular basis? Be specific. I answered that I needed more time in the mornings and I needed someone to take my son to school some days too. That would give me time to do yoga or exercise, journal or even meal plan. My friend sprang into action and told me not to worry, that she would handle things. Within hours, she had arranged for a carpool plan for the morning school commute. Suddenly, I had close to a full hour available to me two mornings a week. For a single mom with chronic health care issues trying to keep afloat, this was a huge gift. Years later, I was able to do the same for another single mom and return the favor. After this intervention for my friend, I spent one of these precious hours reflecting on my self-care list again. I rewrote the list, dedicating a single page to each category of self-care. I created one column to list the activities in the category and a second column where I wrote down the obstacles. I identified each errant snow boot and piece of clutter in my mudroom. I asked myself what might get in the way of me being able to partake in each activity. I wrote down things like time, finances, skills, and then in a third column, I tried to strategize ways that I could, either by myself or by relying on others, be able to remove these barriers. There are three key things that emerge for me by engaging in this process. First, I realized that I wouldn't be able to remove many of these obstacles without the support of a friend or my community. Second, I recognized that there were items on the list where the only obstacle was, in fact, me. With issues like my motivation levels, discipline, and self-esteem, to name a few. I knew that realistically, I needed for someone to hold me accountable when I could not hold myself accountable. Lastly, I realized that some of the items on my list were really ambitious and, at the time, unrealistic. I gave myself permission to remove those items or to leave my plan open for adjustment over time. My self-care plan was not written in stone. It was a living, breathing document that would change over time as my life and demands changed. 
It was a plan that counted on the support of an entire community, one that would soon get to create a self-care plan of their own. Our community would eventually weave together a mutually beneficial safety net of care and support that ensured we could all ask for help without guilt and obtain what we needed, remove obstacles from our path of self-preservation, and hold each other accountable with love and with kind sight.